Well, uh, <coughs> you have heard Alok in the morning. And I uh, think you are <coughs> getting a little bit of the background to the debate of uh, Savitri and death. Most of you know the story. And um, Alok did give you the outline from Mahabharat. But what is important is uh, more than the story element, the experience and the explanation behind the whole thing. In fact, it is uh, the experience that really stands out that makes Sri Aurobindo Savitri so very unique. But I gave this, the same topic a deeper thought because you see it is nice to see Savitri and uh, death in the context of Savitri but then I had a fundamental question that isn't all this a kind of a poetic symbolism. Is death really a personality? We have called him in the in our own mythology as Yama and Sri Aurobindo takes away the name of Yama. But he is fundamentally the same person who appears to us in, in the Kathopanishad, where Nachiketas seeks out Yama, goes to him and says, uh, I want to know your secret. Whereas in this story given by Sri Aurobindo, it's Yama who comes in search of uh, Satyavan and the question is the same. What is the secret of death? And so my basic uh, bent of mind being a little more philosophic, I ask myself the question, how do we place this uh, concept of death, the concept of Yama or the personality of Yama or death vis-a-vis -vis the reality that we face every day? People dying, people committing suicide, people getting into an accident, whatever it is. All of us have faced death in our life. So how do we place them together? How do we reconcile? When somebody in your family is dead, then you don't go and recite Savitri and say, it's fine, you know, it's a principle, so and so, and then so, don't feel, okay, don't feel sad and all that, but, because all said and done, there is a question, there is some kind of a cessation, a kind of a departure, whatever we call in whatever way and um, what uh, Sri Krishna relates or tells Arjuna that all that is born must die so you see there are many things that have been told about death you know then we have to take death as something fundamental to life. That which is born must die. And here is Sri Aurobindo who says, no, it need not die. We could have immortality. So there's a question of, is 
this life, all that is born, getting an immortality. Immortality in what sense? Is it living forever? Or is it deathlessness? I mean, there are so many questions that can be put across the study of Savitri. And uh, I would like to find my own answers. And as I said, uh, the entry for my understanding is philosophy. Poetry I cherish. But uh, my mind says, uh, first let me manana, shravana we all do. There are great people to whom you listen. But I believe also a bit in manana. That means you think it over. You be convinced of your own answers. And uh, that's one thing I'm beginning to adapt in my own living. That not to accept things because they have been said. Fine. Lord Krishna said, Lord Shravabhinda says, the great Divine Mother says, because uh, Because I am beginning to understand the famous, I mean, the age-old uh, adage that Shravana, Manana and Nididhyasana. That you listen to great truths, great talk, great, you know, adoration, speeches. But Manana, you give it your own thinking and then experience a little bit. If you do not have this experiential backdrop and I use it backdrop because even if there's a drop of experience then only there is uh, a greater conviction so even for sure when you're on the mother I applied the same theory I said I don't know what is death we have read about death we have talked about it from sure when the mother So at least I cannot have a nididhyasana, the experience of death and experience of all these big things. But at least I can do some kind of a introspection on manana, on the level of manana. Because the, the controversy, the contradiction always remains between a poetic death and savitri and the reality of death. And if I don't bridge this reality of day-to-day -day death that we see all around us, then Savitri becomes only a poetic expression. And which I know is not the truth, and yet I have to find a bridge. Then I can cross over to Savitri and say, voila, that's the truth. But in the absence of this bridge, a part of me says, no, that's fine, it's, a, it's the greatest book, it's a wonderful book and all that people have written, spoken, etc. And you see, all other things I can understand, but this bridge I'm not able to find. And that's where, again, my prayers go back to him because it is Sri Aurobindo alone who can give us the bridge, who can build the bridge. And uh, for that, my only recourse to is the life divine. So you all have Savitri, but I have the life divine, which is for me more fundamental than Savitri, because long before Savitri was written, life divine was written. So his experience, his philosophy, his explanation, is here and so I thought I would like to take out some passages from this book and discuss with you the the question of death in the sense that it is an absolute reality then why is death necessitated 
I mean, is it just because Lord Krishna says all that is born must die? That seems to be the the pragmatic truth. And so I asked Sri Aurobindo, is, is Krishna right? Is Sri Krishna right in what he said? Of course, many other people have said, I don't, I don't know. But my faith, faith says Krishna must be right. But my mind says, I want an explanation. And uh, it is Sri Aurobindo who gives us a logical answer to the question, of why death? And that question leads me to understanding because as Alok was telling in the morning, Sri says, death is a process of life. Then the question transfers itself to what is life? You see, if death is only a process, okay, let me see the original. From where this process has begun. So, unless and until I understand what is life, I cannot understand what is death. So, my primary question is, what is life itself? I do not see death as an opposition, fair enough. Because normally we say life and death, life and death. Sri Aurobindo said, and, and I understand there, I'm mentally convinced that yes, death is only a process. And all that we can say for the next one hour, but I'm not getting into all that process business. But my question is, where did this life begin? Number one. Number two question is, is death involutionary or evolutionary? That's a fundamental question for me. Because if I get an answer then, there, then I will say, I have no tongue to say that, but philosophically, Sri is right. Right in what? That there is a possibility of an immortality of the body. So, my question would be, is death involutionary or evolutionary? Because most of you, not I guess, but I'm sure, know a bit of Shurabindo's philosophy. The very fact that you have come to this seminar, workshop, shows your deep interest in Shurabindo. So, my first question, <coughs> is what is life, but I'll take it up second. First one, let me answer you, because that's more, much more urgent. Involutionary, as all of you know, there is a gradation of manifestation. There is a gradation of uh, self-creation. And there, of course, all of you know the story that Alok was just referring to, the question of uh, how everything began with those four emanations, the, 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 the story of creation, as Mother would call it. It's there in the Egyptian tradition, it's there in Indian tradition, one of those old traditions of creation of the world. But you tell that to your Oro University BS student, they won't believe that. Modern people say all that is, you know, bakwas hai, some kahani hai. But if you talk to them about the Big Bang, they say, yes sir, that's right, the Big Bang Theory. I don't know why they believe in Big Bang Theory and not in the story of creation. I don't know what's missing. But I think this is also a belief and that is also a belief. They're both in the same, in the same plate of believing. This somebody called the scientist X, I don't know who gave, who gave that name, maybe Ashokji would know that. Some scientists gave us the name of Big Bang Theory and it has come in our textbooks and then on a TV and there is a video and then you go to Google, you get internet 
But nobody has put on the internet. I think Shruti should take up this question of putting all the four, four creations on the internet. You are good in all that PPT and all that. So at least let the people know that there is another theory that is coming up. Because Google has given a lot of importance to big, big bank, people have taken it. But I think I'll make this a project for you. You should do that. So for me, both of them are beliefs. Now, but the question is, are they contradictory to each other? No. They're absolutely one and the same theory. Somebody said there is a, a dot, there is a point, this is infinitely smaller than a, even a full stop. And yet it has all the energy to create an infinite world. Well, I'm saying we Indians, we didn't say anything against that. We said there is only that, that Bindu, what you call Big Bang Theory starting from a zero point. We have heard that long before the scientists who were, the ex, with all due respects, was born or even conceived, we had the concept of the Bindu Brahman. So from that Bindu, from that dot of Brahman, everything began. And the mother's story adds there and she says, from that Bindu, I was created. It's that Bindu Brahman who said, first, let my consciousness energy come forth. Because, what's the meaning of creation? You know the word creation? How do you create? Manifestation. Huh? Manifestation. Whatever is inside, you bring out. Like the woman brings forth out of her own womb the child. So this Brahman, he says, I want to bring forth from the little point of Bindu this whole manifestation. And when he wanted to bring forth, the very question of bringing means energy. The very question of bringing means selection. The very question of bringing forth means consciousness. You see the word bringing, if I say I have to bring out these keys from my pocket, what is the process of my mind? I decided that from my right pocket I will bring out my keys and then I put my hand to bring it out, there is an instrumentation. So there is a consciousness, there is a will and I use force to pull it out and bring it. So there are three elements required for bringing forth consciousness, will and force. So unlike in the, in the Big Bang theory which just says that thing burst and then there is infinite expansion. What the philosophers have said is that in that infinite expansion there is a medium called the consciousness force. And that medium, the Vedas have given the name of Aditi. Fine. And then they said, let Aditi, you go and manifest. So Aditi went manifesting infinitely. Like the Big Bang theory says, out of that great energy, not even consciousness, the tremendous infinite energy started formulating itself and expanding itself in an infinite manner. We have the same language. The Aditi, the consciousness will start expanding itself in the same manner. But the difference that we have is that this expansion did not take place at one go. It took another intermediary forces came in. There were these four creators, whatever their names are. Somebody remembers them? Life, light, love, no life and light and love you have taken. Bliss, truth. Well, all of you are a little hesitant. I'll give you a formula, which you'll never forget. 
can I have that your mic, uh, Tambi? Cordless mic. Yeah, I think uh, you have a little bit of problem. You know this, yeah. That is normally, well I know existence but I am keeping this, this is consciousness, tapas is life and ananda is bliss. So here we see, we can call it love. So remember this formula of sat, chit, tapas and ananda. Out of this formula of the Satchit Ananda, the four forces came, the truth, the consciousness, life and love. So you have life, love, this consciousness or light. So what we said is that in this creation that started, the four forces that Aditya asked to bring out were these four, truth, light, life and love. But just as the Big Bang theory tells us that as the creation went forth infinitely, what happened? You have all these planets and the stars and the sun and ultimately the earth and the mercury and whatever, Mars and all that. But what is the end result of these, uh, these planets? Can you give me one difference that is there between these planets and what is there in the first uh, Big Bang, that spot? What is the difference between the very first point where it started and the, the, the creations at the end of it? No, in the Big Bang theory itself, let's keep to that. Energy getting materialized, fine, lovely. Pardon? Light. The light was, that was there at the source, is it there in the same thing in your, uh, in your meteors, in your, in your planet? Something has happened. One thing is, of course, the energy has become materialized, yeah? Okay. So mm -hmm. Stability. Order. Yeah, that's I take that into point. But my question is. Mm -hmm. Fine, that's the order that is speaking about. Something else has happened. Yeah, energy has got converted into mass and light, and it became the part became manifested exactly. Now that's what I want to tell you that what was there in the origin, there was this great energy, in our language there was this, this Satchitananda, whatever. But even in this Big Bang theory, that great energy which has gone through the stage of confusion, stability, etc., has ended up in one thing, that the energy level has gotten down infinitely. This planet that is there in the Mars, or the Moon, or Mercury, or the Earth, or whatever, thousands of things, they do not have the same energy level as that first point of energy, which we call the Bindu Brahman, or Satchitananda, whatever. So what I am interested in, or looking at is, 
that original point has got divided into multiple things. You see, philosophically, I'm interested in saying that the one has become the many, and the many, as you added, obviously ran into chaos. Some pockets of order, but originally, basically, it's chaos. Secondly, to involve your thing, in this many, each many has remained separate. There is no coming together of the many. And then as you said lastly, that it is only a part. And that is where we have lost the original energy. Now keep the same Big Bang theory to our own theory here. Now as you distance itself, obviously, things go the other way, the opposite way. That one has become many, that infinite many, the infinite source of energy has become so little. Now just the same thing. Truth when it's got into this infinite many, lost the truth, became hmm? also, yeah. And then, light, just one minute, I will give you time later, light, darkness, darkness. then light, love, suffering. You see the exact theory. Whatever story has said philosophically, spiritually, Big Bang Theory has put it in a scientific manner. But this is important for us to understand if we want to relate to death in savagery. Otherwise, you see, the material, material reality that we see around us, as I said, we have to find the bridge, the connection. And in this story, we see how this tapas life, when it goes away from the source, remember what we said? Anything that goes away from the source, goes away from the truth of the source, from the characteristics of the source, from the energy of the source. So everything dissipates, gets diluted. And the, the last point of dilution and dissipation are just the opposites. Falsehood, darkness, death and suffering. So here comes this question of death. Yeah, can I take your question now? Yeah. You say that this. Yeah. It means it is not truth or like, for example, light which is divided from the darkness. Is it proved? I would say that no. No. And then life that is divided, death, is it proved? Exactly. And then love divided into suffering. Is that true? Is that true? Also not. No. Therefore, this is what you say. You see? Exactly. It's not what you say. It is what our philosophy of Shurabhanda says. Yes. So now, we'll come to the proof of that, but I'm telling the story. And as a child listening to a story, just listen and then say, it's a lovely story. And the proof of that, we'll come to that as you go by, okay? Your question, I'll keep it. So, this is where I am trying to build the bridge. Now, based on this theory, I come to the fundamental question I started with. I said, where does this question of this question of what she was asking for prove? And sure, when there is the only one who can give you a concrete proof, and we are going to get into that. But this is the story where I found a relation between 
Savitri and philosophy. But that's yet, not yet the, 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 the concrete bridge. It's only a more a conceptual bridge. I want to come to the concrete bridge. And here, <coughs> as I said, we have to take the help of the Shwabindo's chapters in the Life Divine. And the first thing that he would say is that when the Supreme, when that Supreme Divine became the many, of course that's the, that's the basis of all our philosophy, that the one becomes the many. But in this process of becoming the many, we have seen this is the story part. But then I started with the question of, if you remember, is death involutionary or evolutionary? I'm coming back to that answer question. So in the process of involution, there are many levels. This is one side of the story. But then she says there's a second side of the story given by Sri Aurobindo. It's not a story as such, but it is philosophy. Where he said there are now grades and gradations of the descent of the consciousness into inconscience. Like we said to the story, the truth becomes falsehood and, and, and chit, the consciousness becomes darkness, etc. Similarly, the Satchitananda force or the consciousness, when it comes down the gradation, it ends up becoming its very opposite. And that's what this story tells you. Everything becomes very opposite. Love becomes suffering and life becomes death. So similarly, in this philosophy also, we have seen that the superconscious becomes its very opposite, which is the inconscient. So there is, you know, the, the philosophy and the story, they merge very, very beautifully. And in this process, we have seen the processes as supermind, overmind, then there is intuition, then there are some other intermediary levels, then there is mind and life and the physical and the subconscious and the inconscient. I didn't use the word death anyway. In this involutionary process, do we have any slot for death particularly? No. Where there is an evolution, there is a reverse process. We have the inconscient, where the Savitri starts with that inconscient, where, where things started creating. Then there is a subconscious, then there is a physical, then there is a life, then there is mind. We are going back, he says. But in the evolutionary level, somewhere this fellow can, comes in called death. So where did he, did he come about? Why did he come about? You see, in the evolutionary pattern, there is nothing. Death does not come in. But in the evolutionary pattern, there is somewhere a little bit of a side tracking and we see the element of death. Yeah? Oh, this Yeah. Yes, we have found out that. So now coming back, so we see now death is in between the level of life and mind. You see, we don't speak of death on the level of matter. 
So we have started using the word death only when it comes to life and to mind. And beyond the mind, even in the involution, there is nothing. So in the evolution, there, there will be nothing. But you said even in the, why, should, why did death come in between life and mind? So now we are coming closer to the truth. So now death is not there beyond mind, is not there below life. So only in this intermediary level of life and mind, we have for the first time a new element called death, which was not there in the involution. And all that is not there in the, in the involution will not be there in evolution also. So the death is a kind of a digression that has taken place. So what Shravindo logically tells us that there will be a point of immortality. Evolution will bring about this question of immortality once you go beyond the mind. Because once you go beyond the level of the mind, again, there maybe you will say there is a kind of a digression. No, there will not be any more digressions. Because after the mind, he says, what comes through will be the super mind. So between the mind and the super mind, whatever the digressions, but if the consciousness of super mind is what is coming next, there is no death. So ultimately, what are we dealing with? is the question or the diversification of evolution into death only between life and mind. So here we have at least focused on the problem that death is not an eternal creation. Let, let us be very clear on that. Mind is an eternal creation, life is an eternal creation, matter is eternal, over mind is eternal. But that which has come as a temporary measure, death is not eternal. Even your biologists, I don't know if anyone is a biologist here, they have discovered that death was not there in the beginning of creation itself. It has come as a midway nature brought in somewhere down in the life level as a measure. And it has continued into the mental level because of the human being. Because of a necessary measure. And we call that necessary measure because it's nothing new. You see, even the question of ego is not there in the animals and the plants and the creatures and the snakes and the, and the little flies. So nature has brought in a necessary measure called ego for its own purpose. So like that we must understand now between life and, and mind there are very many necessary measures which are temporary brought in consciously by nature for the purpose of its own evolutionary process. So now we are cl clear because this was, it was important to clarify this otherwise Shurabindo's entire attempt would collapse if we are not very clear, if we, if we conclude that death is an eternity because it is there in the involution, so Shurabindo's theory will not stand ground. So first of all, I wanted to clear this concept that death is only an evolutionary process. And what has been brought in as a necessary temporary measure can be removed by the very nature if the conditions are better, different. So let us now first of all clear. Yes, Shoebindo's philosophy has the possibility of becoming a reality of tomorrow because philosophically we don't see any obstruction in accepting Shoebindo's theory. Now I'm all talking about this in philosophy. But now Savitri takes you to the possibility on the physical level. You see, now see the links. So philosophically, we have cleared the ground. Deathlessness, immortality is a possibility. Now, a possibility becomes a reality 
in Savitri. And how it becomes a reality, how it can be made into a reality, is what Savitri shows you. So you see now the link between the life divine and Savitri. One is the philosophic possibility, the other is a reality, a material physical reality. But it is under a long time frame. It doesn't happen tomorrow or day after tomorrow. But at least Sri though, towards the end of his life, end means last 15 years almost, 35 to 50, he worked on the possibility and the reality. And in fact, <clears throat> maybe in the afternoon when we have a direct session on Savitri, I'll read out some passages where the mother would say that uh, Sri Aurobindo, you know, all, that the exp all the transformative processes that the mother undergoes in her own body, Sri Aurobindo too had seen them, seen them in his body. So because we normally tend to think, oh, it's only the mother who underwent the transformation of the body. And Sri Aurobindo did not, quote unquote, know much about it. Mother, she is flabbergasted to see that in the late 60s, towards the 69, 70, 71, when it was her own peak of the transformation of her body, she says, I was reading book two. I mean, book two, canto, I don't know, eight or nine or something. She says she was shocked to see the same experiences in her own body. Then she says, my God, Sri knew all this. You see, it was a wonderful thing. Sri left his entire secrets in Savitri, which were to be unlocked only by the mother. And only when she experienced it. You see, why is it that we find Savitri so very difficult? Because we don't have an iota of experience of that. Even mother did not know about it. Until her own body started experiencing and she sees her reflections in book two. As all of you know, is the, the, the climb of Ashwapati, the great ladder. So Sri found out in the, in the life divine the necessity of death, the inevitability of death, but then how it can be transformed, made immortal. So that is the that is the pairing, I can say, of life divine and Savitri, and that's why I always suggest if you want to understand Savitri, please turn these pages. Don't do only a namaskaram to this big 1,118 pages, because a lot of people think I can straight go to Savitri, and we can understand that. But that is the greatest illusion you are under if you believe in that. Please turn this 947 pages of this American edition. Because it's very, very crucial. Because all that Alok was telling and all that I will be telling is purely based on the life divine. We cannot understand Savitri per se. You can always enjoy its poetic beauty, alliteration, imagery, symbolism. But the thought is essentially here in this book. Now coming to the direct question of the death itself, as I was telling you now, he will work out the proof of this kind of a transformation. You see, he says, the supreme has become, the one has become the many, fine. He wanted to become all that is Upanishadic story that we did not get into. But then the first question that, that Sri Aurobindo himself asked in some of the previous chapters, in the beginning chapters of the Life Divine is, you see, there are stages of this creation, of this manifestation. Of course, one we said is that, you know, super mind, etc., etc. That's one way of looking at it. 
this is another way of looking at it but there's a third way of looking at it he says first of all if you remember that vedic formula satyam ritam brihat the truth becomes a vastness brihat through the process of a rhythm satyam ritam there's a definite process and that is what the vedas call it called as the super mind super mind's another name is satyam ritam brihat and you see there are such magnificent words you can write a thesis on each word itself so shivananda says basically it is a satyam ritam brihat and this is the third way of looking at manifestation one is this second is the levels of the creation third is the single word satyam ritam brihat now what is this the truth becomes vastness vastness means universalization means the transcendent becomes the universal at the first level of self expansion what we call time and space so this space is very in- interesting that the transcendent who was that bindu matra who was the single spot who is the transcendent who is the unmanifest he descends into time and space and becomes a vritam brihat and that brihat is the vastness and that vastness is another word for universality cosmicity universe cosmos whatever your terms and your your uh, big bang theory also tells you the same thing this energy spreads into that infinite vastness but what we add is that vastness means in time and space because there's a vastness beyond time and space also but what the philosophy clarifies is that there is a, a time and space vastness infinity so let's say we have agreed upon that yes this is the second stage now if this creation or manifestation i know you people are clever enough not to accept the word creation if this manifestation has stopped there in the universalization what would have been the the nature of this manifestation can you guess can you imagine i mean give you a more uh, graphic image if there were only this clouds well it's not a cloudy day but you have a day where the pure clouds all all i'm sure all of you have taken a flight so from your flight you see infinite stretches of clouds that's what i would call brihat the vastness you see miles and miles of white clouds now if there were only these clouds there would have been no individual there would have been no only waves only waves wave so there would have been just a wave of vibration and you know clouds are not concrete there's a vibration waves of vibrations but if if that got arrested at that point there would have been no rain no greenery no earth no water and no you and no me so there was a necessity of that universality becoming the clouds have to become raindrops because the raindrop that feeds my water my plants that goes into the ground tomorrow i drink the water 
so without the raindrops there would not be an ultimate manifestation or creation that means water as he was talking that raindrop in philosophy is called the individual form so the universal has to become individual formations because without the individual formation if there are only clouds what's the fun it's all fine it's a lovely cloud but i cannot live by cloud so the divine also chooses to become individual formations then only there is a meaning in the manyness because when you see the clouds you know miles together you don't see many there's only one formation of a cloud there is no separation and manyness is separation of form so what we are driving at is that the transcendent becomes the brihat the vastness and the vastness becomes the individual it was necessary for completing manifestation but shobindo gives another very beautiful poetic explanation of this individual have you seen uh, Hmm. I don't know. Some of you may or may not have seen, but so I'll give you another example. When you have bubbles, you know you have a big uh, what do you call a drum, and then you make a little lot of put your soap and make bubbles. So a full a full surface of bubbles, you know, hundreds of bubbles are there. So when you go down to towards that, you will see yourself a hundred faces of your own self. the other example i was going to give you was uh, we saw tripshikan myself when we went for rajasthan we used to see this old rajput palaces where they have a dancing hall most of the palaces have a dancing hall so they didn't have these videos and tvs and all that but they were better off than us we we can see only one hema malini dancing but they used to see 1000 hema malinis dancing in one go so that was an a, a tremendous multiplicity of one form one person dancing and you could see thousand form there because ah because in that dancing hall there were thousands of mirrors round beautiful mirrors stuck in the surface and there was a reflection of one person into thousand forms and that is where the selfish divine wanted to see himself in an infinite forms which are we so we are supposed to be the mirror reflections where he can look at himself and feel how beautiful am i <laughs> that's where we are reflecting he initially thought i will look at myself see a beautiful image but we have distorted it i know because mirrors are all of all kinds of things you can distort you can make things smaller bigger distorted perverted so ultimately we are presenting to the divine a distorted image of ourselves and that distortion precisely is called death you see we are coming closer to our analysis so there is this question of the many and in that many there is distortion but before the distortion there is something else that happens so there was this image of the mirror the divine reflecting himself in each of these individual and man is that you know between life and mind we said is a question of man in whom he expected to see 
his own clearest picture that is because man has got the soul the psychic being whereas below man there is his presence but the picture is not that clear there is the in the plant in the animal in the tiger in everything there is the picture but picture is not just sharp it's hazy out of focus so he brought the whole thing to a focus and called that the psychic being and that focus image is now he says wow i can look at myself beautifully but unfortunately something else happens and the divine reflection is not as beautiful as it ought to be so this element of perversion is called death but my last question now is why did this fellow come in if god had such beautiful plans to see himself in in all beauty in each one of us where did this bungling take place where did this thing go wrong that now we are all struggling so much suffering and death and darkness and falsehood and all that now you see the uh, the the coming in of death this bungling who, where did it come why did it come well it came in the very creation itself you know you give birth to a child what is the status of the child 2 month 3 months for so he is a little baby the child is a baby who is what can it can he really prepare food for himself can he dress himself or herself Dependence. huh dependence the baby is what helpless, helpless. one more word incapable hmm incapacitated continue to grow so basic thing is that this child who is just born is incapable of looking after himself so can we blame the child that say hey you cannot cook your own food he says no mummy I, i'm incapable i'm just two days old two months old six months old six days i am incapacitated at this time it's your fault why did you give me a birth so small if i had given a birth this big and big enough i would have done it but you have given me just 4 kilo 5 kilo and a tiny little hands so the child says you don't blame me for being incapable blame yourself so incapacity is our main problem that the first thing that came in was incapacity so we said my god i cannot do things for myself then what do i do if i am incapacity you use a good word grow. grow that means i must become capable you see how the story begins my incapacity is a means of pushing me towards becoming capable and that's why you see every child now i recognize that how much he or she wants to grow grow up i mean that is the beauty of the child that the only element in the child you will see is his his zeal his anxiety his is wanting to grow up means what he is wanting to become capable that's the only characteristic of a child and rest of your education policies blah 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 is all to make the child capable of course we have all kinds of wrong educational methods to make him incapable we don't give him the proper guidance and all that and integral education says nothing but make him capable of knowing by himself that's the line so the essential aspect of the child is to grow and the moment he stops growing 
that's a physically at a point of time he stops growing then vitally he stops growing mentally he stops growing so as he stops growing the, the third fellow comes in the death fellow you see as long as you are expanding growing no child no woman no man no young fellow ever thinks of death the first thought ideas of death will come to you only when there is the question of incapability of growth that's why the mother would say even at the age of 60 you start in fact at the age of 60 you start growing so now we see the opposite of death the 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 solution is the growth so if you keep growing then this fellow called death may not come in because i'm growing and one day i will grow beyond the mind and grow toward the supreme where there is no death so what is the solution to become beyond to be to go beyond death is to grow beyond the realm of death and what is the realm of death life and mind so now we get a simpler solution that going beyond the mind to the levels far beyond or going beyond the reach of the of death which is again in this soul and these are the two realms where you can go beyond death it is not the question of making the body deathless science today has lot of means to make you live 400 years 300 years but that is not immortality that is only longevity you have extended the life of the body but your vital your mental may be the same uh, little thing that is there you know like like a tiny little tot so you have to expand the life of the body the capacity of your vital consciousness vital capacity of your mental consciousness and that is where now i understand why the mother was all the time talking about if only i lived a hundred years when she was 94 95 you see in her agenda how many times she says if only i could live a hundred years she wanted to extend the life of the, her own physical to 100 years because she was expecting something to happen if she lived at 100 years because there is and then she also said one has to grow one has to go almost till the age of 300 years is only if your body lives for 300 years not the not the scientific body please remember not the medicated body or the body in the lab you can put some injections and make it live for 300 years. not that body but a body which is continuously being under the influence of the higher consciousness or what we call today the supramental consciousness so it is a lot of things friends don't think immortality is longevity is not immortality is not the soul when the soul the body the mind the life every one of them grows then you have immortality that's why satyavan is not given back to death so easily because savitri herself has to grow you see why shravindo brings you to canto 11 whereas in canto 10 at the end of it you see mr gentleman vanishing away death is conquered and he he runs away his light eats up eats him up and all that the beautiful lines but satyavan is not returned you have conquered death but the question is you have to grow beyond death then only the new consciousness the new immortality will come so the return of satyavan is important not the conquest of death is is a necessary step so shravan had to bring in canto 11 a book 11 where he so shows the transformation of death and where he shows again the transformation of savitri we'll deal that in the second half when we take up savitri but i'm trying to connect here that the secret to deathlessness or immortality is an integral growth what we say growth of consciousness or whatever 
this is the thing where we see the incapacity <coughs> is an impetus in man to grow. So God has verily made our not only our body incapable, but in the beginning we say, oh, my mind is so limited, my vital is so limited, I cannot do that. But you know, there is something called, that fellow called suffering and pain. So the suffering and pain whips you up, saying, hey, you have stopped growing. Your mind has stopped growing, your vital has stopped growing. And the pain I bring you, and then that is a whip. Hammer of God, you know, all of you remember that those lines from. What's that pain is the hammer of God? To break the resistance. To break the resistance. You see the resistance? Resistance of growth. It's the moment we, you know, we sort of succumb, we say, I'm fine, you know, I've got my bank balance and I've got my house and my two cars and my children, you know, nowadays the famous thing is, my children are abroad, they are well settled. Yesterday only I missed. somebody comes and says, Mera beta settled hai, he is there, he's got married, he's got his grandson, no problem, the second son is abroad. So we think that is the end of life, my children are settled. And so you stop growing, you say, fine, close your doors and be parda ka pisha beto. This is psychologically how we get stunted. We don't grow beyond that age when my children are settled, retirement age and all that. So, when something happens, when death comes in, why do you complain? That fellow says, hey, you stopped growing, so I'm taking you. You see, continue to grow, I will not touch you. So, the thing is, the most important part of the growth is to have a good lunch at the right time. And I'm sure Deepshika and uh, Gayatri are giving me the message. Part of growth is lovely lunch. And that's waiting for you. Ah, I mean, you go and freshen up yourself. They go and freshen up the food. So, yeah, I mean, you know, this has fascinating subjects. And uh, Life Divine and Savitri are two aspects of my own growth. So I love to speak and to connect. So we'll have long six days to chat a little bit. Okay. So from 2 to 2.45, again, uh, Alok will come and continue. And 2.45 to 3.15, we'll have a tea break. And after tea break, I'll continue with my chat. Right? Yeah. But in the afternoon, I'll take up uh, Savitri per se. Let's see how much we can chat and we can enjoy. Yeah, now in the afternoon session. I will question another thing. I question in the morning the reality of death, the necessity. And trying to find some answer to bridge the gap between the reality of death and the way death is presented in the in Savitri. But now I'd like to take up the question: Who is Savitri? You see, in the morning it was, who is death? Now the question is, who is Savitri herself? But before I take up uh, some inquiry into the topic, into the question, I'd like to read out a couple of things uh, what the mothers spoke in connection with Savitri. You see, with all her busy schedule, 
the mother had to take out particular time to read Savitri and she says she has read it four times. And uh, this is what is amazing, even the mother telling us. Every time you read it again, it's new. That's a very interesting phenomenon. Every time I read Savitri, I feel as if I'm reading it for the first time. Really. It's not that I understand differently. It's that it's completely new. See, I mean, we can understand because we have been asked to read and we do read some of us. But we may add a, a, a shade of meaning, a little, uh, an extra understanding, one more word becomes clear or one more thought becomes clear. But for the mother, she says, it's not that I understand differently, it is that it's completely new. I never read it before. It's odd. It's at least the fourth time I read and truly there's everything in it. All the things I have discovered lately were there. And I haven't seen it. It's odd. The first time I read it, read it was a revelation. It hung together perfectly well from beginning to end. And I felt I had understood. The second time I read it, I said to myself, but this isn't the same thing as what I read. It hung together, it made up a whole, and I understood something else. Then recently when I read, at every passage I said to myself, how new this is, and how the things I have found since, uh, since are there. Today again, that's how it is, as if I read it for the first time, and it puts me into contact with the things I have just discovered. So, I think we can understand the meaning, we don't have to try to explain that. Obviously, she's finding something new each time she reads it, because it corresponds to her own experience. See, she's herself going from experience to experience, different layers and levels of experience. And so the same passages, the same things, she is finding different. So it is a question of uh, a discovery because she has herself moved on to a different level of experience. It is not a mental, intellectual grasping of ideas or images or symbolism. So I think that's what should be, I would not use the word our aim, it's a bit too big to aim for. But we understand that yes, this is where things were hidden. As I told you in the morning, the Sri had written some things and because she got the experience now, you see, first time when she read it, maybe she didn't grasp that because her, her own physical transformation was not at that level. But when she came to that level, she discovers a reflection of her own experience in Savitri. So it's magnificent to see that all that Shwabindu wrote lies embedded there in a seed form. And our discovery ought to be a discovery 
of consciousness. Not a discovery where we look up a few more word meanings and we say yes, it's clear. And perhaps uh, that's why a kind of a rational intellectual analysis of Savitri is not very welcome. I would not use the word forbidden. It's not very welcome because uh, it must correspond to one's consciousness. And uh, some of us, of course, read it. We get a joy, obviously. There is the aspect of Ananda. Because it uh, it must have come into Shobindo as as a as an expression of his delight, as an expression of his delight of his own discovery. So it's just like a poet, you know, his main source of inspiration is the delight. In fact, if I can add the word beauty and delight. So if Sri has really put it down in a mood of expression, in a mood of beauty and delight, so obviously Savitri lends itself to an appreciation of beauty or of delight. Nothing of the mind and reason and rational imagery and trying to comprehend. Well, you know, for us the beginners, we may try to get some meaning out of it. It's just for the satisfaction of the mind. Otherwise, sometimes the mind feels uh, a bit stupid saying that, oh my God, I can't understand that. But I suppose uh, it's something what the mother says is a revelation and a discovery. Well, we'll not get into more of that. Uh, there's more things to read out. And um, there's one passage which has thrown a lot of light in my understanding of uh, what we're trying to uh, see about this theme of uh, death and Savitri. At one point, um, Satprem asks the mother that um, just as Savitri brought back Satyavan, so the mother is going to bring back Sri Aurobindo. Is it possible? You see, that's what we normally think, you know, it's just a juxtaposition of the same experience between Savitri and Satyavan, so, so the mother and Shurabindo. But the mother says, but you know, the Shurabindo said he wanted to come back on the earth only in a superhuman body, a supramental body. So I can't bring him back. And... Um, well, let me read the next para before I take it up. A host of problems have instantly arisen. You see, there's a considerable difference between human life and animal life. And there will be a considerable difference between superhuman life and human life. Supramental life and human life. But then in what sense? Take wholly practical things. Will they have houses? How will they live? Etc. Etc. Um, so here the first thing that we see is that he wanted to come back on the earth only in a superhuman body. If I, re if I relate it to Savitri, there also as I was telling you in the morning, Savitri does not get back Satyavan in the same old form. Well, of course, very diligently, yes. 
old form is there. Satyavan is the same old form. If you can see when you, when we see Satyavan waking up, there is no change of form. We can recognize his Satyavan is waking up. But the consciousness is completely different because as we are told that he comes as the new consciousness. So we sure have been, though it could have been possible that he comes back with a new consciousness, but as we all know, he already had the new consciousness, the supramental consciousness in his body. So it is not a parallel thing with Satyavan who gets the new consciousness into the old body. Where Shravananda had already gotten this new consciousness into the old body. But not to bring back Shravananda would have been to bring back a new consciousness in a new body. But that new body, we cannot bring it, we cannot make it. And that is why, the one of the reasons why the mother took up the challenge of transforming her own body after 1950. She didn't try to transform her body before 1950. So you see the meaning there. Because Sri Aurobindo says he wants to come back in a supramental body. So mother worked on that new supramental body in herself. And that was the tapasya that she does from 1950 to 1973. Because the level of consciousness, everything that was already done. Now there is a question of producing the, the body that can sustain the new consciousness. Imagine with the coming of the new consciousness, supermental body, uh, Shravabhita's body gave up. It is not ready to hold the new consciousness, the supramental. So even Shurabindu, although he has experienced all this on the subtle physical level, the gross body had to be given up. So it was very obvious that a new body has to be prepared. And so the mother takes up the transformation of her own body. And even there you saw in 1973, the old body had to be given up. Although this time the difference was that Shurabindo left the gross physical without producing a subtle physical body, therein the mother succeeded to produce a subtle physical body which could hold the supramental force but which was not yet able to transfer transfer itself into a gross physical. So she leaves the gross physical on her bed and she pulls out, expenses out the subtle physical golden body and leaves it there in the occult world. So that is the difference. Shurabhinda left only the gross physical behind him. But the mother leaves behind the gross physical because nothing more could be done but prepares for the future of humanity. I would not say humanity, I would rather put it as for the future of nature herself. A sample, a module of a new body. And now left to nature, it has some kind of a, a sample, a module in front of nature to move on to. You see, in one of her conversations, she says that she was the first one who produced the human body in the process of evolution itself. When there was only the, the animal kind, she was the first one who came and gave to nature the first draft of the human body and then leave, left it to nature which over thousands of years produced the human body. But that's what nature always wants. It wants some kind of an example, an example to follow. 
So imagine the work the mother has done or she does leaves to for nature the the next form if I can say the next form that suits the next consciousness is not that she gave the lion and the tiger and the, and the trees no those are not the next form of a new consciousness because the next form of the mental consciousness she gave the human body the next form suitable for the supramental consciousness she gave the new new body and that is one of her pioneering works so when we say an avatar and all that that is fine is not just for the sake of humanity it's for the sake of evolution she has been producing something to replicate and that is why her tremendous yajna from 50 onwards to 73 where she gave a new body that's one of the reasons where she says i cannot bring him back because he wants to come back in a new body so that new body she prepared and uh, one more thing uh, and this uh, now what i learned from this short uh, answer in 1973 imagine it was 9th of may 1973 and by then uh, she had stopped uh, giving darshans i think mid mid march or sometimes she had withdrawn completely and uh, so she's uh, she's telling i'm eating less and less so I'm constantly uncomfortable and so weak. That day I felt that the movement was going to accelerate and a time would come when a radically different way would, be, would have to be found. Perhaps the supreme pressure of death is necessary to release the almighty powers shed in nature's cells that Sri Aurobindo mentions in Savitri. As though the supreme power could only be released by the supreme contradiction of power and death shall reveal its mask of immortality. Try to understand that. This is very, very crucial to understanding Sri Aurobindo Savitri. That this was the day when Satyavan must die. So what was the necessity? You see, in, in the form of a story, it's all fine. I mean, there's nothing much to argue there. Narad comes and says, 12, years hence, uh, 12 months hence, he will die, etc. But as I said, I'm not really taking to the story. I'd like to get a, little, a deeper layer of meaning. So, was it necessary for Satyavan to die? Okay, we can say both ways of argument. He died and he did not die and all that. That's fine. That's for the scholars. But why was this death itself announced? Hadn't it, hadn't it been better if Narad had not told uh, Savitri about the death? Let us imagine the scenario. He says, fine. Because in, in some place he says, uh, Narad kept back his immortal knowledge. He doesn't reveal. If he had really not revealed, let's imagine what would have been the scenario. If Savitri had not been told about Satyavan's death, what would have been the scenario? Can you imagine? It would be no conscious process. So it's a very good conscious process. Conscious process of what? Of the soul procedure, uh, consciousness of Savitri, reflecting on all these points, the decision she has to make, and then also the experience to follow that. I think that's an amazing experience. It's yeah, you have got the line, but you are not able to catch the essence of it. You have an idea, but can I hear some other thing? Pardon? Prepare for the? Of what? Does she have that ascent? Yeah. And her search for her soul. She has to meet soul. 
That's it. What she was saying, the same thing. You see, I mean, how Savitri, as I said, if Narada hadn't told her, then this entire story is not that Savitri would not have fought Yama and then even if Yama came, she would say, okay, fine, Satyavan is dead, my husband is dead and all that. But a foreknowledge is important because the very fact that she's, she knows that Satyavan is going to die makes her go in the direction of what to do about it, how do I stop it or how can I get back Satyavan. So here the foreknowledge is a great helper in a sadhana. For us, such a great, such a foreknowledge would have been a dampener. If I knew that somebody is known to me or close to me will pass away within this time, what would be our attitude? We would be depressed. You know, completely hopelessly we say, my God, the person is going to go away in this time. So even that is why it is said God does not give man the foreknowledge of things to happen because we are not courageous enough to face the truth or face the future. So that is one of the things as we say ignorance is bliss. We don't know our future. It's only the strong minded people, the strong willed people who can face the future. So Savitri herself was iron willed. Because remember, even when Savit, Sat, Narad declared that he's going to, Satyavan is going to go away, then the mother of Savitri, she dissuades her. Then she says, Father, I have chosen and I choose not again. So that kind of, you know, spurs her up, her courage, her will, her, her sleeping avatar wakes up and she says, no. This is the mission for which I have come, not to give in as we were reading in the morning to consent with a weak consent or something, to, to sign with a weak consent. She is not here like you and me to consent to the nature's fate, to nature's fate. So one is that, then as she said, uh, the preparation required. And in that preparation, the very first thing she is told is you have got to find your soul. You see, the whole meaning of her sadhana is to go and conquer death. Like we said uh, for Sri Aurobindo, the mother wanted to not bring back, but prepare his future body, not her future body. The future body in which he will come. So it is that which spurs her up to say, I will start this yoga of transformation in my own body. So see how there is an element where something takes off. And so it is very necessary that Satyavan should, uh, Savitri should be told. And then what, what I'm trying to explain is this line, that uh, the some supreme pressure of death is necessary to release the almighty powers in nature's cells. So it is that pressure of death, death of Satyavan, and that is what releases in her the tapasya, searching for a soul, then uh, the ascent and the descent of the higher forces, etc. And then the conquest, conquest of death, and then not only the conquest of death, you see, if, if the thing had stopped at the conquest of death, what would be the scenario? The Satyavan would come back in his old consciousness into his old, own old body. But that won't be the purpose of Savitri to get back Satyavan in the old body and in the old consciousness. 
So let's not understand Savitri to be just a victory over death. Is victory and transformation of death. If it, if it's just a victory, okay. I mean, I can understand. But as I told you in the morning, he would have at the most he would say, okay, you have conquered me. You get back your satyavan. But nothing new. He would have been again the same old satyavan with the same old consciousness. That that's where Mahabharat ends. This Mahabharat story ends. But Sri doesn't end his Savitri with the story of the Mahabharat. His entire purpose is to show the next step of evolution. So in the next step of evolution, there is no death. There is a transformation of death. So after the victory of, of death, you will see some passages, uh, we will come to that later, where uh, Savitri says, you are my instrument, stay on, for some more time you are useful. You are useful, you are needed. So that is that some more time where humanity will have to go through that passage. It may take you thousands of years, but it is still required. But when the supramental consciousness comes, death itself would be transformed. And there, what I was telling in the morning, we would have surpassed the level of the mind, gone more towards the super mind. And when one humanity goes towards super mind, there is no necessity of death. And what a wonderful description. I mean, you read again that uh, book 11 or book 10, well, you'd be doing with uh, Alok. I mean, it's a magnificent thing to see how death is not really that, that, that mask. In fact, he is that Virat Purusha. He is the divine himself. You see, is, I mean, what Indian mythology, Indian spiritual truth has experienced is extraordinary. That death himself is the divine in his origin. You see, as just as we talk of angels and devils and Satan and anti-divine forces, we talk of death as one more mask. So the divine has come down putting on different masks for himself, for the sake of the play, for the sake of evolution. So here we see that magnificent description where he, he is, in fact, he is described as Virata Purusha, Hiranmaya Garbha, and he is the Turiya. And I mean, all the four levels of the divine consciousness are there in, 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 in death. So he is no different from the Supreme Purusha. But that is a level of the supermind. It's not the level of our human consciousness. So we see that almighty power shut in nature's cells will reveal itself, will reveal um, themselves under a tremendous pressure. And Savitri is put under the tremendous pressure. Well, uh, we'll come to more descriptions. I'm just reading out a few things directly connected with uh, Savitri and death here. And uh, there's one more passage uh, which I'd like to read out before I take up uh, the main text. Um, Mother says here, <coughs> There's a line from in Savitri which says, Earth saw my struggle, heaven my victory. Yes, <clears throat> but she couldn't win the victory on earth because she lacked heaven. She couldn't win the victory in life because she lacked death. And she had to conquer death in order to conquer life. That's the idea. Unless we conquer death, the victory isn't won. 
death must be vanquished there must be no more death so that was the mission for which she came and uh, then she goes on to the next mission of uh, revealing death in his own true aspect now there's a very very sweet letter here which i thought you know which will be relevant for some of you you see um you see in india we have the custom of uh, touching the feet of the elders of the guru of the divine and so the gentleman here uh, obviously it was satprem who asked the mother in 1967 i've just heard that though the grace flows from all the limbs of the guru such as the eyes and hands what emanates through the feet is the most dynamic and full of compassion that's why it is said the indian tradition enjoins pranam to the feet is this true in fact i remember this was a question asked to me in germany i mean because the western tradition can never think of why touch the feet you know the better hands and cleaner hands the feet are dirty so i remember some of them asked me the question well i didn't know these lines but look at the mother says here is shobindo's answer to your to your query and i'm sure all of you know this lines where she presses her feet course miraculous streams of an entrancing ananda that is of course the mother chapter 6 and from savitri all nature dumbly calls to her alone to heal with her feet the aching throb of life so mother really was quoted the perfect line saying that where she presses her feet course miraculous streams of entrancing ananda so when you bow down to the feet of the lord it is obviously through the feet that you get the best of grace and compassion and in this book the supreme also uh, you see the role of the mother's feet how wherever she presses her feet on earth there there is a vibration of the super mind which is getting into matter so the feet are obviously the most blessed part of the lord it seems well with that um, i have few more but uh, we'll come to that when we reach the lines so after having read that now i come to the main question of who is savitri because it occurred to me that is there only one savitri in this book so that's the first question when you say savitri which savitri and especially when savitri is facing death is it the same savitri who was born as ashwapati's daughter and the brilliant lady and the brilliant daughter so obviously there are many savitris in the same book but using the word many may be misleading what shrub in the rights about the mother that she was conscious of the divine even in her childhood then with in connection with the prayers and meditations he writes a beautiful thing he says it is the mother i mean most of the prayers and the prayers and meditations are from the mother identifying herself with the earth consciousness and so when she is saying my supreme master oh the divine mother it is not someone else 
it is in the Vedic image, you know, in the image of the of Agni. In in the Vedas, the, the Agni has three roles. He is the Purohit, one who prays. He is also the Agni who receives the he is also the God who receives the prayers of the human beings of the Purohit. And then he is also the person who lends it to the Supreme and brings back the answer from the Supreme to the Purohit. This is exactly the role of the mother in the prayers and meditations. She is the individual mother. She is the mother who is uh, representing human aspiration. And she is the same divine mother. So it's actually she is speaking to her own higher self and the higher universal self speaking to the, her transcendental self. So, oftentimes we are amazed to see how the mother is telling, you know, I want to forget the I, I'm, I'm, my I is one with the, I'm completely identified and she has sorrow of the earth, you know. But you must immediately see which is the mother who is, who is really praying, then only it will become easier for us to understand. Otherwise, uh, sometimes it may be a little puzzling. So we see here, Savitri is similarly, many Savitris, but it's the same one consciousness. Now what Sri Aurobindo again reveals in his letter is, she is increasingly manifesting her, her divinity, who the mother. Now that's a very important phrase I caught and I thought it is applicable to Savitri. That the mother also, what we see in her own life, she is increasingly manifesting her divinity. It's not the mother who was there in France as an artist or as a person who was going, you know, to Raphael on a on the cycling, competition of the cycling. And the mother, that mother who was there in Paris was not the mother who was there in Egypt or the mother in, in, in Japan or the mother in Pondicherry or the mother in 1930s and 40s and after 1950. So here also we see different phases of the mother. But the single consciousness which is revealing, which is increasingly manifesting her divinity. Remember this. And we have the same thing applicable to Savitri. So, the Savitri who is confronting with death is not the same Savitri, at least is not yet revealed the same divinity when she was the, the, the daughter of Ashwapati. So, what I would like to do with all of you is basically take out the sketches and there are presumably six or five sketches that uh, the poet gives of Savitri. And I'd like to study these sketches and see how she is manifesting more and more her own divine qualities so that by the end she is ready to face death. Because it is not human eyes that can look into the eyes of death. It has to be some divine power. It has to be somebody transcendental to death who can deal with death. So the, the Savitri, the beautiful Savitri that Ashwapati sees grows in dimension of her divine consciousness Ultimately, she becomes a transcendental power and then she strikes on death. Before that, she is talking to death, she is arguing with death, not arguing is the right word, but discussing, debating. But when death challenges her saying, show me your power, show me your true face, so that I may even worship you. So at that time, it's like, you know, both of them unmask each other, uh, unmask themselves. Savitri unmasks her human face and shows her transcendental face and death also unmasks itself and shows its own transcendental divinity. 
So there's a beautiful ending where both the masks are unveiled, are unmasked. And you have the, 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 the divine as the mother, the divine as the supreme. So ultimately there is the debate between Savitri and death leads to the supreme mother and the supreme divine. The Purusha and Prakriti, Ishwara and Ishwari, whatever you want to call the Satchidananda and Aditi. So it is not something that, you know, but Shravin though as a poet, you see, I'm looking at, at, at the book more as, as, a, as, as an evolutionary aspect. So it would have been, I think, very flat if Shravin had given only one Savitri, all the time she is divine and all the time she is, the, 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 the poetic justice would not be there. Because Shravindo always believes that in every variety, in every cre creation, there is a tremendous variety. There must be, there are levels of consciousness. And each at its best. For example, when he speaks about the, the different poets, Valmiki is there, Kalidasa is there, Shakespeare is there. Dante is there and Homer is there. So he says, yes, Valmiki and Vyasa are the supreme most poets. Definitely they are the most supreme, the highest poets one can, what humanity has ever produced. Then there may come down somewhere down the line Homer, second or third position. Third position may be Kalidas, and the third position may be, may be Shakespeare. I'm not sure about the levels, but Homer and Vyasa and Valmiki are the highest. But he goes forth to say, it doesn't mean one is greater than the other. That's what is important. Please remember, he never will compare saying that he is greater. Number one position is not out of greatness. Because Vyasa could not have outsmarted Shakespeare in his own way. Shakespeare, what he does, he's nature's poet, he's a creator of characters, he's a genius of nature's poetry, language is brilliant. Vyasa couldn't have done like Shakespeare. So he says, what Kalidas, uh, what and then Kalidas, what he could do. Your Homer couldn't do that. So what he wants to tell us is that the divine manifests on each level in a perfect way. What, you know, the, which is better, a rose or a lily or, or a jasmine or, or a lotus? Both are perfect in their own sense. You cannot say lotus is better because it's got 12 petals and jasmine has only 5 petals. The fragrance of jasmine and the fragrance of lotus you can't compare. So what he says is, similarly in the human level, each level of creation has its perfection. And that is why he is divine. He is not perfect because he is on the super mind and is imperfect because he is a, a, mud of, a clod of mud. The clod of mud is as important, as perfect as the super mind. So it is our rational comparison which says, oh, super mind is greater than this pot that's in front of my garden. It is our comparative mind which says that. Because in one place he writes saying that the Brahman has an equal ananda in being a mountain for millions of years as being a superman. So it's not that in this evolution superman is coming, so Brahman is more happy, now I've got a better thing, I can fly around, I can do what I want. He has an equal joy in being a mountain for standing there millions of years as being a superman. Because after all, this whole thing is out of his own delight. So he cannot have less delight in a mountain and more delight in a superman. He is not that. The divine is full, with his full delight in every creature, in everything. That's why there is sometimes what we have in this famous Sanskrit sloka, you take out the fullness from the fullness and still it's the fullness. Purnamism. 
so that is the beauty of our of our vision that he is there in his in his fullness in everything so coming back to savitri it is that beauty that you find savitri 1 savitri 4 savitri 6 all the savitris have their perfection so there's only one divine savitri but one divine savitri who is more divine because she is wonderfully human remember that that's what i said had shobindo presented only a divine savitri the book won't have been all that interesting because it would have shown a tremendous distance between the divine and the human there's no empathy and sure when the savitri if it has anything it has this marvelous thing tremendous empathy with the human beings their suffering their sorrows the solution and in fact if she didn't not did not have that empathy she wouldn't have fought for death had uh, fought death because she does so for humanity's sake so saying this i don't like to come to these sketches and bring out this point of the human and the divine and so if you have your books i would like to i will i don't know i don't carry the 93 version i carry my 1954 version the oldest one because this is the one that the mother had given me and uh given me with a wonderful blessings so i can't choose any other version latest or biggest or the best so i'll try to help you finding out the passages and uh, let me tell you one more thing the very first uh, description of savitri comes in book 1 canto 2 no it is actually book 1 canto 1 um you see a para a new para starting with and savitri too awoke among these tribes page 6 yeah now this canto in fact those of you who have read and studied some of savitri would understand this is a misplaced canto canto 1 is a misplaced one misplaced by the author the poet himself jan buj ke as we say purposely does that misplaced in the sense if you see the sequence of this canto it belongs somewhere in a book 3 or somewhere but shrimda brings it as book 1 canto 1 because it is the height of the event is the climax in this entire story of savitri which is there only for 24 hours from dawn to dusk not even 24 hours so in this short time within 6 am to 6 pm because when he when he wakes up satyavan says hey is getting savitri savitri is getting late and is getting dark let's go back home our parents may be waiting for that so just 12 hours so imagine just a description of 12 hours we get 24000 lines and in this 12 hours this book one canto one seems to be around midday i did catch a link somewhere but i could not pin down the line so what's happening the climax of the day is when satyavan is about to die and this being a big uh, as it is called an epic shobindo follows the tradition of writing an epic poem because all epics be it dante or homer or milton they begin with the climax of the action that means the central point 
on which hangs this entire story. So this is an epic. So obviously he had to start with this central event. And the central event was the death of, this was the day when Satyavan must die. He doesn't go with the 335th day or 285th day. He comes straight to 365th day because that was the day when Satyavan must die. So the whole scenario opens in front of you on the last day of Satyavan's death. So, Shurabindo, of course, you know, you have seen the letters at the back of this book. I don't know if your book has got. So many letters are there thanks to Amal Kiran, who has uh, brought out so many responses from Shurabindo. Where we see Shurabindo is a master of uh, poetic art too. He doesn't forget that he is writing a poem with an iambic pentameter. So he follows the rhythm, the, the, the traditions of poetic writing of an epic. So he has really kept very strictly to the form of an epic. So from that point of view, he kind of starts with a bang that this is the day when Satyavan must die. So that is why he had to bring this event which would have otherwise been chronologically elsewhere, but that would have been a flat beginning, you know, Satyavan, Ashwapati. Really the book starts with Ashwapati, book two, where Ashwapati did not have children and blah, blah, it goes there. But that would have been storytelling. Once upon a time, you know, beta, Raja, Rani, the, it is not that once upon a time, because this doesn't exist in any time. It's an eternal story actually. So you can't even <coughs> build into it once upon a time. So he banks with an event. And the advantage I've seen, the poetic advantage, as we will go through, that uh, he captures the reader's attention immediately. Because if it is a story of once upon a time, you may be still sleeping. Dekha jayega when the Rani comes and when the king starts, when the prince elopes with the queen. That's the highest in tap tak dekha jayega. Another 20 minutes we can sleep. But when you start with a bang like this, your eyes and ears are open. My God, what's happening? So he catches your attention. And once he captures your attention, he gives the essence of the whole poem in this canto one. Well, as self advertisement, which I normally do. You know, long back, no, you are not there. I think you are there, yeah. Mala was there when I had a camp in Nanital. And uh, this is actually. CD one, book one, canto one, imagine. And this was for two and a half hours. So just this canto one at Nainital we did and that's where I met Mala for the first time. And then after 15 years, she comes back. Who else was there? Only you, no? You were there in that? Oh yes, I forget. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ray. I was thinking of this uh, Madhunandini. Now you are there, I'm sorry. Yeah. It just missed my mind. Ha! Uh, so she was there and says, I'm happy that you have come back, you know, to, to after 15 years. Yeah, this is Canto 1 and for 12 and a half year, hours. And I gave that especially because this has this whole theme of Savitri. Not only does it catch our attention, but it really gives you the whole theme of who Savitri is, her mission, her character, Satyavan must die, and what is evolution itself taking, the, it's as if the, the creation has begun. You know, it, it's, it's a whole massive text is there. So I could explain almost the whole of Savitri through that canto one. 
So that was the beginning. So that's what I'm saying. That's the advantage here. And then I don't know if I want to start with that or maybe I'll take up a chronological order because if I get into Canto 1 now, I don't think I can take up next five days also, it will be not sufficient. So what I would like to do is take it up in the chronological order. Let's go back to once upon a time. So I would say please take up book four, Canto 3. Uh, that is uh, book four, canto three. What's the page? Uh, it is uh, four twenty-two. Is in mine, and your pages are. The line is that I would like to take up is approach through sunbright spaces, Savitri. Uh, I don't know how I can guide you on that. Maybe one, two, three, fourth page from the beginning. Fourth page from the beginning of Canto 4, uh, Book 4, Canto 3. 372. Started with Approach Through Sunbright Spaces, Savitri. Got the line? Yeah, all of you please get to 372. Yeah? Now this is the place where we get the description of Savitri through the eyes of our own father. And that is the, the beautiful, enlightened, bright Kanya, the charming princess. And uh, Savitri has come to her father, and the father sees her coming into his court, into his room. He gives a beautiful description. It's more or less why I've chosen this is it is the physical Savitri. We can say not physical, physical, but we can largely say it is the physical description, a description of the physical Savitri. So that's where we can start the, the journey. The, we can go to the higher levels. But always remember, whatever may be the level, there's always a combination of the human and the divine. So she is not just a daughter who is, you know, who is a, a fond, a fondling of her parents and who love her. No. Here is a, is a, is a father and a yogi who is looking at his own daughter. So there's a kind of a double vision that's always playing. So let's take up these lines and see what we gather. I'm not going to go through in detail, but more to give you an impression of this Savitri, the physical description. Um, the voice we drew into the hidden skies, but like a shining answer from the gods, Approach through sunbright spaces, Savitri. Advancing amid tall heaven pillaring trees, apparelled in her flickering colored robe, she seemed burning towards the eternal realms, a bright moved torch of incense and of flame. That from the sky-roofed temple soil of earth, a pilgrim hand lifts in an invisible shrine. So these are imageries there, but we show you see the the image of this uh, apparelled in her flickering colored robe. You can see already her robe, her dress. 
She seemed burning towards the eternal realms, a bright moved torch of incense and of flame. Now it's a very beautiful image where as if you know a devotee is burning his incense and raising the incense not towards any particular god but into the sky you know as an invocation prayer to the divine. So that flame that goes, so Shobindo is, is, is comparing that dainty colorful flame to this flame of Savitri. So he says uh, that uh, there came the gift of a revealing hour. He saw through depths that reinterpret all, limited not now by the dull body's eyes, new found through an arch of clear discovery. These intimation, this intimation of the world's delight, this wonder of the divine artists make, carved like a nectar cup for thirsty gods, this breathing scripture of the eternal joy, this net of sweetness woven of aureate fire. You see, it's this, there's a tremendous poesy here. There's a lot of poetic artistry. You see the words, I mean, you have to be sensitive to this here. The intimation of the world's delight. You see, he's seeing his daughter walking towards him and he sees her not as a physical form, beautiful physical form, beautiful face, beautiful limbs. But is already into seeing a kind of a Savitri beyond and behind Savitri. Look at the word, an intimation of the world's delight, this wonder of the divine artists make. You see, the divine art is the ace cap. Now sometimes, you know, when we look at the garden, when we look at the flowers, or sometimes, you know, when you are on a National Geographic TV, you see some flowers and imagery. And you wonder, you know, you know, oftentimes Dipshika and myself, we say, God, what a fursat se bana hai. You know, it's all the time to make this little thing. So it, it is that kind of a fursat se bana hai, this kind of a divine artist make. So it's as if God had all the time to make Savitri, so beautiful, so perfect. Carved like a nectar cup for thirsty gods. This breathing scripture of the eternal joy. You see, this is the most beautiful thing, breathing scripture. The whole wisdom, the whole jnana, whole bhakti, everything sees a kind of, as we say, is a walking beauty. He calls her a breathing scripture. I mean, I think it's really at the, at the height of a description of a person. A breathing scripture of the eternal joy. This net of sweetness, woven of aureate fire. This net of sweetness woven of this aureate is the golden fire. Because she had that golden attire. But this net of sweetness, I remember one face, obviously. Yes, yeah, she was that net of sweetness. I mean, there's another line which appeals to, applies to her very well. But she was sweetness, she was breathing scripture, and a divine artist make Transform the delicate image face became a deeper nature's self-revealing sign. A gold leaf palimpsest of sacred births, a grave world symbol chiseled out of life. You know, the second line we should understand. Transform the delicate image face has transformed and trans the deli delicate image face became transformed, a deeper nature's revealing sign, a gold leaf palimpsest of sacred birds. You know, palimpsest is a document wherein you erase the old and write something new. So in this document of this being of Savitri, it is as if the divine had erased the, all the old and written a new law and written a beautiful new being. So he is presenting Savitri as one of those very fresh new documents of beauty and delight. A grave world symbol chiseled out of life. Her brow, 
a copy of clear unstained heavens was meditation's pedestal and defense. I mean, I, I don't know if you understand the meaning of meditation's pedal. What's the pedal? Try to understand that. You know what's pedal? Huh? First step, not necessarily. Yeah, it's a platform on which you sit or stand or whatever. It's a pedestal, you know, what we call. Now, it's comparing her forehead, her brow, uh, with was meditation's pedestal and defense. Try to imagine that this on her brow, which, is, which seems to be so calm, so full of peace, Shanti. It's as if meditation itself is sitting on her brow, you know. It's, her brow is a pedestal for meditation M cap. It's not you and me meditation. It's the meditation which finds a beautiful seat on her brow. It is so calm and peaceful. So meditation's pedestal and defense, the very room and smile of musing space is brooding line infinity symbol curve. Is brooding line infinity symbol curve. You know the line that goes with our eyebrow, on our brow, the whole thing seems to be infinite, uh, the curve of the infinite. I made her tresses, and you see, I'm, I'm drawing you again and again to this picture. You see, she's the physical uh, Savitri, and yet, there is always the double vision of the non-physical, of the supra-physical. And this is what runs through all of Sri Aurobindo's poetry. He has sometimes very sensuous imagery and almost Kalidasan. And yet, there is this Aurobindonian aura there. That is the magic of this poet here. He has the, the, the always the, the visible and the invisible in every description. So if we are blind to the, or insensitive to the invisible, then we say, hey, these are only sensuous lines. What's big about it? But you must catch the, you know, when we say the sensuous, when you say this, in poetry there's no painting. In a, in a painting you can see a woman in a sensuousness. But in poetry, you don't see, but you feel the vibrations. So these vibrations that are there, that offset Savitri and all of Sri poetry. So here we see, I made her tresses, cloudy multitude, the long eyes shadowed as by wings of night. See that? Long eyes shadowed by the wings of night, this eyelashes. I mean, extremely poetic. I mean, you will not find even in your romantic poetry such romance. So the eyes shadowed by beautiful night, it says wings of night, under that moon gold forehead's dreaming breath were seas of love and thought that held the world. See, her eyes, you know, how, what a beautiful description. Her eyes were seas of love, the forehead, the thought that held the world. Marveling at life and earth, they saw truths afar. Who? Their eyes. So, I don't know. Yeah, we have to only refer to her eyes, you know, we have no other human eyes. He says, marveling at life and earth, they saw truth suffer. No, she's not seeing. Look at him. He's seeing. His eyes look at truth afar. I mean, there is a distance. They are here and yet far beyond. That is the impression. So, that's why, you know, you must have seen uh, Hutaban's paintings of Savitri. Sometimes she has caught this look. Because they have to be human and yet, you know, bring in this touch of the, of the look afar is very difficult. A deathless meaning filled her mortal limbs as in a golden vase's poignant line 
they seem to carry the rhythmic sob of bliss of earth's mute adoration towards heaven released in beauty's cry of living form towards the perfection of eternal things again he is here is giving us here a description of the mortal limbs you see what if shravinda said a deathless meaning filled her limbs what would have been the difference why did he add the word her mortal limbs you see he need to have added seeing all that but he specifically adds the word mortal limbs why for what for what is the reason human aspect yeah yeah the invisible but here as they say he has you see he's he's a bit going they seem to carry the rhythmic sob of bliss of earth's mute adoration towards heaven we are being carried a bit away from earth you know in the previous lines we were being led a bit away from earth so suddenly he brings you back saying that no they are mortal limbs so in that mortal limbs once he connects you with the earth then he can take you away see take you out of this earth so there's always this this round of the earth and beyond the earth earth and beyond the earth otherwise as i told you in the introduction savitri would, would become irrelevant if she is all the time up there we have no connection so for us to to be enchanted by her you see we the human beings need to be enchanted and for that enchantment we require the physical beauty and ethereal beauty we are not enchanted we want somebody in flesh and blood and so sure when they very carefully says a deathless meaning filled her mortal limbs as in a golden was a poignant line they seem to carry the rhythmic sob of bliss who who seem to carry that the limbs the limbs are carrying the rhythmic sob of bliss what is the sob of bliss you know sob of sorrow we have heard but this is shocking to say the sob of bliss huh joy so joy so intense is the joy that it's so it's sobbing and but um, uh, they seem to carry the rhythmic sob of bliss where where is the joy i mean whose joy is it you say it's fine joy you know out of joy also one cries one may be having a great sob you know but whose You see, she is carrying the bliss, the joy of earth. So, she is carrying that the bliss of humanity, of earth. And having told this much, I'm sure you remember something of her prayers and meditation. Yeah. Do you remember some specific prayer from her? when she was 13 years old every night she used to lift herself up into the sky and her robe would enlarge itself widen and enlarge people would come there to touch that robe and the moment they touched all their grief and sorrow was gone so this is how we see savitri in a very limp she crossed she carried not the sob of cry and sorrow but they were a bliss so you see i mean what a marvelous technique she he is telling you about about her beauty of the limbs and yet how they are earth touched they are not an ethereal limbs and beauty which are nothing to do with earth he is saying they are carrying the beauty and bliss of earth itself so you see the 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 the, the balance between the earth and the non earth that's why i'm saying 
The Shobindo is apparently sensuous, but is always beyond, is always the other side. So we have this rhythmic sob of bliss of earth's mute adoration towards heaven, released in beauty's cry of living form towards the perfection of eternal things. Transparent, transparent grown the ephemeral living dress, bared the expressive deity to his view. You see the word uh, expressive deity. Again, suddenly there's a leap into the Godhead. I mean, there's this marvelous, I mean, the poetry or the poet is at his best, you know. I mean, painting something physical and non-physical in the same line is extremely, I mean, I would say very, very difficult. Because we have seen Keats and, and Kalidasa, either they are fully sensuous, or we have uh, ten, what is that other guy, Keats and uh, another romantic? Byron. No, not the Baron. No. Shelley. Shelley is again the other side, who is non physical. He is, he is on the ethereal side, who is more mystic. But they are either or. But here is a man, is a combination of both Shelley and Keats at their best. So we have bared the expressive deity to his view, escaped from surface sight and mortal sense, the seizing harmony of its shapes became the strange significant icon of a power, renewing its inscrutable descent into a human figure of its works that stood out in life's bold abrupt relief on the soil of the evolving universe. A Godhead sculptured on a wall of thought, mirrored in the flowing hours and dimly shrined in matter as in a cathedral cave. Again, <coughs> here, of course, we see her more like a deity, what he has expressed, you know, the deity in the cathedral cave. And all the description, the strange significance of an icon of a power, renewing its inscrutable descent, etc., a Godhead sculptured on a wall of thought. You see, I mean, look at the expression, wall of thought, sob of bliss. I mean, these are not uh, cooked up. These are poets' concrete imagery. I mean, you, you may find all your Milton's and Shelley's, such phrases which are, you know, Almost contradictory, sob of bliss, wall of thought. This is such wall of thought, but she is a goddess sculptured on a wall of thought, mirrored in the flowing hours and dimly shrined in matter as in a cathedral cave, annulled were the transient values of the mind. The body's sense renounced its earthly look. Immortal met immortal in their gaze. So now they have come to the climax where Ashrapati, the yogi, no more the father, the immortal look of that yogi, is looking into the deity's eyes, his own daughter, who has been elevated into that level of a deity. So you see a marvelous line, immortal met immortal in their gaze. Awake from the close spell of daily use that hides soul truth, with the outward form's disguise, he saw through the familiar cherished limbs the great and unknown spirit born his child. So the great <coughs> and unknown spirit, of course, is for him, he is still the unknown, though he knows who is she in reality, is after all a branch of heaven transplanted upon earth. So we have here, <coughs> yeah. Uh, Ashrapati. No, no, right from what all I read just now, is Ashrapati looking at her? 
right from the line approach till this end, the great and unknown spirit born his child. These are <coughs> the description of Savitri seen through Ashwapati's eyes. So in the middle we have seen, it is all the time Ashwapati is looking at her, but there is a mixture of an imagery of the deity and the non-deity, the mortal and the immortal. And towards the end, he comes back to the physical child and says, she is my daughter, she is my child. Yeah, that's clear. Yeah, that's true. Okay, good. And mm, well, uh, then of course they meet there, and then Ashwapati tells her daughter that uh, now you go, O oh spirit traveler of eternity, who came from the immortal spaces here, armed for the splendid hazard of thy life, to set thy conquering foot on chance and time, the moon shut in her halo dreams like thee. A mighty presence still defends thy frame. Perhaps the heavens guard thee for some great soul. Thy fate, thy work are kept somewhere afar. Thy spirit came not down a star alone. O living inscription of the beauty of love, missiled in aureate virginity, what message of earthly strength and bliss in thee is written with the eternal sun-white script? One shall discover and greaten with its his life. To whom thou losest, I'm sorry, loosenest thy heart's jeweled strings. O rubies of silence, lips from which there stole low laughter, music of tranquility. Star lustrous eyes awake in sweet large night and limbs like fine linked poems made of gold stanza to glimmering curves by artist gods depart where love and destiny call your charm venture through the deep world to find thy mate for somewhere on the longing breast of earth Thy unknown lover waits for thee, the unknown. Thy soul has strength and needs no other guide than one who burns within thy bosom's powers. They shall draw near to meet thy approaching steps, the second self for whom thy nature asks. He who shall walk until thy body's end. A close-bound traveler pacing with thy pace the lyrist of thy soul, most intimate chords, who shall give voice to what in thee is mute. Then shall you grow like vibrant kindred harps, one in the beats of difference and delight, responsive in divine and equal strains, discovering new tones of the eternal theme. Well, I didn't want to go into that because we are concentrating on Savitri. But this is only to tell you that now Savit Satyavan, I'm sorry, Ashwapati asks her to go and find her mate. But also there's a little, uh, you should concentrate on this, the description of Satyavan himself. He's not an ordinary person that you will get because somebody who knows you as an eternal partner, your soul. Well, I'll leave it at that. And tomorrow we'll take up the next aspect.